Hello everyone, welcome back to MLS Moves. Please make sure you like this video down below and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Before we get to the video, I'd like to thank you all for your support and remind you that we're doing a jersey giveaway when we hit 3,000 subscribers. 3,000 subscribers is our goal to reach by the end of this month, so make sure you subscribe, stay subscribed, follow me on Twitter at MLS Moves for the latest updates on the giveaway. Now, on to the video. MLS and Liga MX has been heating up even more in recent years with MLS improving on a year-to-year -year basis. Liga MX has still dominated MLS in most games and tournaments until recently where it's been more even. I brought on ESPN reporter Eric Gomez to talk about both leagues, the CONCACAF Champions Cup final between Columbus and Pachuca, and if MLS will pass Liga MX and never look back. Okay, we have Eric Gomez today of ESPN Mexico. He's here to talk about CONCACAF, uh, Liga MX, MLS, the Champions Cup, get his opinion on uh, just the competition in general, both leagues. Eric, welcome to the show, man. I'm so glad to have you. Hey, appreciate it, Will, anytime. Yeah, so one of the things I want to ask you, um, now you've been covering, how, how long have you been covering Liga MX now? Oh, man, uh, you're going to put me on the spot. So I think I've been covering League MX professionally now for the better part of uh, 14 years. So, yeah, around 14 years, 14 years. So you've seen all the beatings MLS has taken over the years, <laughs> more specifically in the Champions League now known as the Champions Cup. Yeah, you know, the Champions Cup is an interesting thing. Uh, we've had a lot of very exciting games between League MX and MLS teams over the course of the last few years, definitely. I think in the end, it's always, you know, with with the exception of two, 2022 and the Seattle Sounders, but uh, it's always come out Liga MX's way. But, you know, in the end, I think um, you can really point to uh, some important moments of the last decade or so to, to really pinpoint the fact that uh, MLS is, is growing and uh, the rivalry between both of those leagues is definitely growing. So it's not yeah. all bad. Yeah, like one of the things that always um, comes to mind when I think about, you know, all the traumatic moments as an MLS fan uh, when it comes to CONCACAF Champions League is one player that always comes to mind is Darwin Quintero. I feel like he was just an absolute MLS abuser for many years. Um, I think he, he he played for Club America, and then did he play for Pachuca as well, or what was the other club he played for? Santos Laguna. Santos Laguna, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's that's what it was. But I just remember that he was a, a terror for any team he was playing in, in Champions League. And I was at one point, I was just kind of like, "Are we ever?" <laughs> are we ever going to seriously compete in this tournament? You know, it, it's always been more one-sided, um, like you just alluded to. 2022 is the only year that MLS has come on top, even though there's been a couple other, um, uh, you know, times where they did come close to winning. Uh, uh, Chivas in, in Toronto in 2017. Um, do you, okay, one of the questions I ask you, one, one of the questions I want to ask you is, do you think that when MLS inevitably does pass Liga Mekis up, which it looks like that's going to happen one day, right? I mean, that probably just because the 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 investment, the the type of player that MLS can attract, maybe that Liga Mekis can't attract. You know, uh, at one point there was South American players that would not even look twice at MLS, and they would come to Liga Mekis. That was a, a huge reason why Liga Mekis was so much better. Do you think when MLS passes? Liga Mekis that they'll never look back? I don't know. You know, I think MLS has two really big things going for them even now, obviously. One is strength in numbers, the amount of franchises that MLS has, you know, the amount of clubs that that play uh, in the league is enough so that you can have – different types of teams with different types of, um, you know, roster building strategies and, and investment strategies in general. Um, and that, in my mind, that has been the biggest reason why the U S men's national team has taken the enormous strides that it has over the last 10, 15 years, right? You've got teams that are looking towards the future. They want to become selling clubs as you would call them in, in, in Europe and develop talent and essentially just make a profit off of them when the moment's right. And they've been really good about doing that. And when you do that, you develop a lot of really good talent. Now, there's another type of MLS team that is looking to 
try and dominate the league via these big signings. And, and it, that's not to say that they're not developing talent themselves. Right. So um, I think you'll always have a chance if, you know, 30 MLS teams, uh, if even six of those teams do it the way that uh, I just mentioned, right. Inter Miami would be a really good example. We've seen examples of, you know, the LA galaxy and LAFC and other clubs try to build rosters that way. Uh, in the past, if you have a grouping of teams that attempt to really just go out there and dominate the league and dominate the region, then you will get to a point where eventually you are, you know, neck and neck with Liga MX teams. I think overall, the leagues themselves, right? One is very different than the other because there's, you know, MLS has a salary cap. Liga MX does not. MLS, as I said, you know, closer to 30 teams. Uh, Liga MX has 18. Um there are really big differences between both of those leagues that kind of make a comparison difficult. But at the end of the day, I think MLS, um, you know, we're coming up on 30 years of the league uh, being founded. Uh, they'll be happy if in the, not maybe in the short term, but in the midterm uh, future, you're able to compete and maybe trade off CONCACAF championships with League MX teams. When that happens, I, I, I anticipate another sort of long period where that's the norm. And mm-hmm. then maybe like when, when we're old and gray, we're looking at MLS just completely wiping the floor with League <laughs> MX. But I still think that's a ways off. Well, and, and that's one of the things. There's a lot of banter, obviously. League MX, like I had said, like you know, anybody who follows the leagues has dominated the Champions League for many years. Um, I think that Anybody watching, though, the gap is closing. And I think it's impressive because Liga Mekis, like you said, they don't have the same structure. They don't have a salary cap. They don't have transfer fee limitations. They don't have all these wacky rules MLS implements, right? Isn't that impressive that Major League Soccer is able to compete at a level with these clubs when they do have all these barriers and limitations? You know, I, I mean, I, I think this... Um, this past summer during League's Cup, I kind of looked at some of the transfer fee records for some of the, the top League MX clubs. And there, I think if we were using MLS standard rules, they would have 11, 10, 12 DPs per roster. The fact that MLS only has three per roster and they're able to compete with some of the best in, in Mexico, isn't that somewhat impressive be, with the limitations that they have? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at, at the end of the day, Um, I think, again, both of these leagues have teams that um, both both leagues are actually very sort of balanced. There's a lot of parity uh, in both of those leagues. So last year you had Leon, you know, go out there and beat a very good LAFC team for the final Champions League title. Um, Now in 2024, when it looked like uh, it was going to be all League MX in the last uh, few rounds, uh, you've got a couple of surprises with, you know, Columbus beating uh, Monterrey and the, or Tigres and then Monterrey and, um, you know, America, which was the Club America, which was the the sort of the favorite to win it all. They they go down to Pachuca and suddenly you have a Pachuca versus Columbus crew final, right? Which honestly, uh, I mean, I think Pachuca is still a slight favorite just because I love their coach and I would love the way that their roster is constructed. But Columbus is fantastic. So to your point, yeah, it's absolutely a, a feather in MLS's cap that they're able to uh, compete with all these teams. I think going back to something I said earlier, there's strength in numbers, right? When you have so many clubs competing and essentially, you know, CONCACAF uh, is allowing you a couple of extra berths here and there with, you know, the Canadian championship, which almost always goes to MLS teams. And, uh, you know, back in the day, maybe even a, a U.S. Open Cup berth or whatever, that's going to allow you to, you know, just essentially um, have better odds. But uh, at the end of the day, I still think it's wonderful when teams in MLS in general are able to work around all those limitations that you just mentioned and compete with teams that are free to spend however, you know, just the wildest amounts of money possible. Because honestly, some of those league MX transfer fees are just completely exorbitant. Um, and and be able to uh, to compete and sometimes win against those league MX teams for sure. I, I don't remember which club it was specifically. I think it was Chivas. Obviously, Chivas has to spend more because they're you know only Mexican international or Mexican national team players. Um, 
And I think they spent 15 million uh, euros for a left back, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. Maybe it was another club I have them confused with. But I remember there was a like a left back that a Liga MX team spent like 15 million uh, euros for. And that would absolutely never happen in Major League Soccer. Like they're never going to spend that amount of money. Most teams won't even spend that money on a, on a 10 or a striker or a winger. Um, but, you know, one of the things about both leagues I think is important is that they need each other because in order to make the region stronger, you need to have more than just one good league. You know, you look at all, like, obviously in Europe, there's several great leagues, you know, in South America, there's several great leagues. And I think that MLS chasing Liga Mekis for so many years, and it looks like they're getting closer and closer. Now, I, I assume you don't think that they're there yet. And many people would agree with that because they just don't have the trophy cabinet to support that evidence yet that, it's great to have two leagues in the same region to make each other better. Iron sharpening iron. Now, the the one thing that does hurt is uh, it's not it's not hurting the money, right? Leagues Cup, but I just don't think it's necessarily a, a fair tournament to measure both leagues when you got one whole league playing completely on the road, traveling thousands of miles in one month. You know, I, I can't remember which club it was specifically, but there was one club. It was crazy the amount of uh, distance they had went during the tournament. And that's right. just not really a fair metric to compare both leagues. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you can say the same about Leagues Cup, right, which I, I assume we'll get to a little bit later and, and has been great in, in terms of just kind of upping the banner between fans of both of those leagues. Um what I like about it is that it does kind of show the potential and it, it boosts the confidence of some MLS teams that don't get the opportunity maybe to compete in, in CONCACAF um, as regularly as they would like to. So at the end of the day, I mean, you said it best, iron sharpening iron. I think, you know, on the national team side, the U.S. men's national team has used Mexico as a um, as a kind of a. Uh, a, a way to measure their progress. And now that they're completely uh, above the Mexican men's national team at this point in time, they can look at other, you know, big nations around the world and say, okay, well, you know, we're, we're kind of king of the mountain over here and our little patch of dirt. Now we can look at, you know, competing against South American teams and European teams and what have you. Um, I think the same can be said for CONCACAF at the uh, league and the club level. Um, for many years, it was very, you know, it, it, it was just a given that League MX teams would win in CONCACAF, right? Um, yeah. Even before we went into this Champions Cup, Champions League format, um, that was that was kind of the norm to the point where Mexican teams didn't care, right? And you would have these really weird uh, things happening in the 70s and the 80s where Haitian teams and teams from Suriname and Costa Rica or whatever would win the CONCACAF tournament because Mexican teams were fielding their, their U 17s. So what I really like about um, this era of CONCACAF football is the fact that we have, you know, just MLS has grabbed league MX's attention and they've done that in a very forceful way, because anytime you have the opportunity to face off against a team in a league that has the capability to sign Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez and Slatan and, you know, Carlos Vela and Giovanni Dos Santos and all these Thierry Henry, all these fantastic players that have played in MLS, then that's very attractive. And now there is a, a very sort of, um, you know, important thing that league MX teams can look at and say, okay, well, you know, the club world cup is changing now and it's going to be a bigger tournament. So we really need to, get our stuff together and, and continue to beat these MLS teams. Otherwise we're going to lose spots in that, in that tournament. So, um, you know, it's a, and it's, it's an interesting confluence of things. I think MLS um, is a fantastic league in many respects. And there are a lot of things about ML, MLS that I would love league MX to kind of copy and emulate. I think the one thing that MLS has to worry about is, you know, League MX is using MLS to make a lot of money. And the more money that they make, they already don't have a salary cap. The more money they make, the, the more that they'll be able to not just sign better players from South America and elsewhere, but to attract all of these really interesting investors that we're seeing now with teams like Necaxa, right? Where you're seeing people from all over the world just kind of come together and say, hey, League MX is kind of a diamond in the rough. What if we invest here and, and try to bring this this league and this product up. So that's the one thing that I would worry about if I were, you know, Don Garber or anybody over there in Manhattan uh, running MLS. 
So when I look at Liga Mekis, especially within the last decade, it looks like the level of investment has went up. It, maybe not so much recently as it was maybe like five or six years ago because there was a huge jump. I remember T. Grace was buying Valencia, uh, obviously, uh, Jignac, like that was probably closer to a decade ago, and right. uh, Vargas of, of Chile. Um, do you think that there's going to be a point where instead of Liga Mekki spending 10, 15 million for a guy, are they going to ever enter that realm of spending 20, 30 million uh, for a player? Yeah. You know, uh, the Sportico valuations came out yesterday, which are, you know, fun in and of themselves because, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to debate uh, how well the leagues are doing. I, I'm surprised because, you know, valuations are different. Valuations are speculative. What's not speculative is the amount of income that you make. And if you look at that part of the graphic, those League MX teams are making a lot of money. And really, if you think about it, they kind of shouldn't be because they're not necessarily relevant outside of Mexico and the United States. Um, the only team from MLS that I've seen have more of a, you know, continental appeal or at least a regional appeal is obviously Inner miami so I'm, I'm down here in Mexico City and I see those hot pink shirts all the time. And it's six year, six year olds, 10 year olds, 15 year olds and, and adults wearing those shirts. That's a great thing to have happen. At the end of the day, um, I think you need that if you're a part of either league, because if the more money you're making, and that goes back to my point in uh, talking about Leagues Cup and, and just the amount of games that we're having now between MLS and league MX teams and this FIFA ruling, which will eventually allow league MX to play league games in the United States is also going to be so huge for them. Then, you know, I can absolutely see a scenario within the next five years, even where Dias is spending 20 to $25 million on, uh, on a player coming over from Europe. Um, you know, a lot of these companies, multinational companies that own league MX teams, Tigres, Monterrey, Club America, Chivas, now, you know, Nicaxa. Um, you've got former Astros GM Jeff Lunau investing in a team in the second division. They're going to be able to uh, come back to uh, Liga MX sooner rather than later. And you're just going to have more economic competition between those teams. And you're going to see a, a, a better level of players that even, than even, you know, now. Because, as you said, 10 years ago, Tigres was able to sign Gignac and, um, you know, six or seven years ago, Monterrey was able to sign Vincent Jansen from Tottenham Hotspur. And you're seeing some of these players come over from Europe and take a chance. You know, Monterrey has Sergio Canales now, who is playing in, in La Liga with Betis. That's a really, really good player. And they were able to get him for 15 million euros, which is a lot of money, granted. But I, I see a future where, you know, we, we're – these league MX teams, they're, they're going to go after some European targets even because they're going to be able to offer them even more money than mid-tier or even Europa League borderline Champions League teams in terms of salary. So it, it's crazy, but I, I'm assuming it's going to happen here pretty soon. Well, one of the things, too, about MLS specifically, I believe personally that Major League Soccer has the potential. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be in the next 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. I'm just saying one day, sometime, they have the potential to be a top three to top five league because of obviously the media market the ML that uh, the United States has, the desire and urge for people to live here, bring their families here because culturally it's a melting pot. There's all kinds of different backgrounds. Anybody can fit in over in, in the U.S. somewhere, right? Um, and I just think it's kind of like the stars aligning opportunity for a lot of players that maybe want to come over here. And I, I, like I said, I don't know when that's going to happen, but I believe in order for Major League Soccer to reach their true potential, they have to have a partner, a, a rivaling, a rival uh, league that can push them to be better. Because if it's just one good league, there's not really any metric to really measure them. They're not playing. Uh, they're not going to be playing uh, Premier League teams every week or La Liga teams or uh, Bundesliga teams. They're being, they're going to be playing Liga Mekis teams the most. That's the 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 league they they play the most out of uh, out, out of league play. So that's the metric. And I believe it's I I. I 
I get a lot of hate because I do give Liga Mekis fans in the league a hard time, but I'm just, it's all banter. It's just for fun. But I do realize how important the partnership is between both leagues in order for both of us to reach our main goal. And it also is a crucial for our national team. Kind of like you said, I, I personally think that um, the Mexican national team has kind of hit a wall and, right. and, and, and they're not nearly as good as what they were 10, 15 years ago. I mean, not remotely. Um, and I think that's, that is a Liga Mekis issue. There's a lot to do with that, you know? Um, whereas MLS, you know, all the the young players are not really staying in MLS. They're not even normally making the first team. They're going to Europe as soon as they're, they're able to. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that having two good domestic or two good leagues regionally is going to not only help, obviously the league's quality of play, you know, ironing, iron, sharpening iron, to use that term again, uh, that phrase again, but also raise the national team because you need to have good regional partners or it's going to make it harder for you to reach your goal. Yeah, that's that's, I think, exactly what's holding uh, the Mexican national team back. You know, League MX is an importing league. MLS is more of an exporting league, even if you do have teams that, again, are going out there and signing the likes of Lionel Messi. Um yeah, so in essence, what's going to end up happening is League MX is going to have to reevaluate reevaluate what they're doing at a league level. And I think a lot of these teams, as the gulf widens, because again, no salary cap, you're going to see, you know, we're already getting to a point where it's always Tigres, Monterrey, Club America, every single season semifinal. Those three teams are almost always going to be there and you know, one or two of them are going to be fighting, fighting it out in the final. Um, a lot of these teams, even without or with the benefit of no pro rel at this point, are going to have to reevaluate and say, well, we can't compete with these guys. Uh, we need to find a different way to, uh, you know, compete and, and build a competitive squad. So they're going to have to look towards their youth teams. They're going to have to develop talent. Maybe they're going to have to adopt a model, a model that's more befitting of an MLS club that sells their best players over to Europe to make a profit and kind of reinvest. Pachuca does that. You know, I'd I'd say that they're the only team that kind of commits to that. But the one barrier is they don't sell their best players to Europe. They sell them to Liga MX teams because the market is so inflated. That's what ends up happening. So again, you know, MLS has a very tried and true way of, growing over the last few years, which is expanding, right? Strength in numbers, to say that again. At the end of the day, you're going to get to a point where enough of these teams are doing things a certain way that gives them success that they're going to go, you know, head to head with these league MX teams and again, give them fits. So for me, that's that's just the most important thing that MLS teams individually and as a collective need to focus on in order to reach that main goal. You know, if you, you're talking about MLS becoming a top three league in the world, there's a touch of American exceptionalism in that, which is fine. You know, that's that's the way this country is, is, has built itself and, and kind of move, you know, become the, the most uh, powerful country in the world. Um, but at the end of the day, I still think that, you know, Europe is not only home to a lot of first world nations, economically speaking, but it's the first world in terms of soccer. Right. Mm-hmm. So. MLS is doing a fantastic job of kind of rising above other third world soccer nations um, and attracting their best talent to, again, live and work in the United States, which is not a, a, a small deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. But, you know, if you're a 23 year old, 22 year old, 21 year old player from France or from Italy or from Spain or, you know, the Netherlands or whatever, that's going to be a harder sell. That's going to be a harder sell because you're not really offering them a, a you know, a, just a, a, a wholesale lifestyle change. It, it's more um, not moving horizontally, but maybe the leap in in sort of quality of life isn't as big as you would want it to be. So I still yeah. think that, you know, they need to think about different ways uh, about, you know, attracting that talent. I think eventually the one thing that's going to push MLS over the top when they're economically stable enough to do that is just get rid of the salary cap because when as soon as you do that you're going to attract deeper pockets in terms of ownership i mean mls already has some really really heavy hitting billionaires but at the end of the day they know that their investment can only go to a certain level right 
once you loosen the purse strings and you get five, six, eight, ten owners c- competing with each other, um, then you're going to see some really crazy stuff. And that's when I think that the landscape will will really change for MLS. I, I honestly believe right now with the brand that, that Inter Miami has built over the last year, especially with having Messi, Suarez, Alba, Busquets, you know, Barca light, you know, uh, I believe if they didn't have these roster restrictions, salary, salary limitations, and they could sign any player they wanted, they would probably be a top 20 to top 30 club in the world because of the players they would be able to attract and the money that they have to where they could sign. Now, that's not going to happen, obviously, because there's too many cheap owners in Major League Soccer who never want to see that happen. They don't want to have their feet to the fire toward their looked at to have to finally uh, put up or shut up. You know, like there's there's too many cheap owners holding the league back. But I, I still think I've kind of changed my tune a little bit on this. I do believe if Major League Soccer can still reach pre, uh, a certain point where they're a respected, maybe top six to seven league without necessarily getting rid of the salary cap altogether. Now they would have to raise it significantly. And I'm sure you saw the news, obviously the premier league are are about to implement their salary cap at some point in the near future. So I don't think a salary cap necessarily prevents you from being a top league, but they just have their, their, their ceiling is just way too low at the moment with what they're able to spend. Um, and, and, you know, I, that's one thing I wonder. I wonder if, if uh, Liga Mekis, you know, they've already implemented a couple things that Major League Soccer has done. Like they got rid of promotion and relegation, which they done that like four years ago, right? Or was it more right. recent? Yeah. yeah. So so it makes you I, – I do wonder if one day maybe even Liga Mekis would develop their own type of salary cap or, you know, some type of limitations to bring, make it more balanced for certain clubs. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's that's one thing that they'll never do because the money is uh, too important, right? I mean, mm. think about, you know, streaming is not just something that's going to affect U.S. sports rights or, you know, in, in soccer, top European leagues uh, in terms of the Premier League and La Liga and what have you. Um, it's trickling down already. I mean, to League MX, we're talking about Amazon jumping in and uh, talking about consolidating League MX TV rights. You know, that's happening right now. Um, they're going after individual clubs, and uh, hopefully they feel that if they get enough of those teams to sign on, then they'll be able to put a compelling package together to kind of centralize those rights and do something similar to what Apple is doing with MLS right now. So, um there's too much money to be made. And the only way that League MX can continue to attract these new investors is ironically by spending more money because they know that there's way more money to be made at this point. If they mm-hmm. set a salary cap, you know, you already have cheap owners. You talk about cheap owners in MLS. You, there's already cheap owners in League MX. And we're talking about really, really rich guys. You know, uh, Club Tijuana's owner um, is a billionaire. And he essentially is also the owner of, or rather his father, is the owner of the main casino, the main gaming company that sponsors League MX in Caliente, right? Um, That team should be top five in payroll, top three in payroll. They rank towards the bottom. And if ProRel hadn't been abolished four years ago, I'm pretty sure that they'd be in the second division by now. So that's something that, you know, I think isn't necessarily holding back either of the leagues. Sorry. But um, I would say that it, it kind of widens the gulf between, between the haves and the ha- have nots. Right. Um, again, Tigres, Monterrey, Club America, maybe even Chivas in the near future. If they're able, able to jump in on that Amazon deal, those are the teams that spend the most. Those are the teams that are going to provide um foreign investors and fans at, at home and abroad reasons to tune in to league MX and reasons to kind of pay attention to that league. Similar things are happening in MLS. I know that there are other reasons why MLS won't consider abolishing their salary cap, which I completely respect and completely understand. But at the same time, um, I still think that, you know, despite what some owners might want both sides of the border, um, MLS might have to loosen its purse strings or its limitations for these teams in the very, very near future uh, in order to, again, achieve those goals. Because as I said earlier, 
the one thing that could hurt MLS in the future is the very thing that is helping them right now, which is that close knit relationship with Liga MX. The closer that they get to Liga MX, the more that Liga MX is going to grow economically speaking. And, you know, I've said this many times before um, when Liga MX fails to see a use for MLS or the, the opposite happens, MLS is kind of clear of Liga MX um, there, that relationship is, is just going to be dead in the water. Right. So essentially it's kind of a showdown. They're kind of looking at each other square in the eye. Everything's, you know, great right now. It's, it's a fantastic relationship, but at the end of the day, uh, when one of those leagues again feels that it has no use for the other one, then that's when things are going to change. So that's the one thing again that I would kind of point to uh, over at MLS HQ and say, you guys better be mindful of that because um, you're really, really benefiting from this relationship now. But somewhere down the road, that might not be the case. Well, to one last thing, I want to ask you to wrap up our first part of our, our episode um, is. I want to get more and in specifically into the champions cup because the final is, is next month. I think it's the first, it's two legs. Obviously I think it's, it, I don't know if the second legs in June or if the first leg is in June, but it's coming up soon. It's in a couple of weeks and Columbus has done the unthinkable. They knocked off Tigres. A lot of people thought they were dead in the water. They weren't going to be able to go to, to Monterey and, and win that match or that series. Then they knock off Monterey, which was a very impressive win because Monterey is, top two, top three club in Liga Mekis at the moment. And they they beat them down, Eric. That's not something yeah. a Major League Soccer team does. They, the only go- goal that they scored was an own goal by Columbus. And right. they beat them, for, you know, so this is something, I, I mean, I was absolutely shocked. I'd never seen anything like it, Major League Soccer-wise, with you know, c- when it comes to Liga Mekis on the road. And Pachuca, the, un- the unsung hero, right? The, they knocked off the Giants, America. Uh, so... What what's your feeling about this game? It seems like it's just two underdogs, and it's going to be a classic match that could go either way. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, you said it best. I mean, these are two very kind of plucky underdogs that beat the odds, but um, at the same time, I mean, all props to them because both of these teams have been fantastic throughout the Champions Cup. I mean, in hindsight, now we can look back at what they've done and said, "Oh yeah, you know." <laughs> They had more than a puncher's chance. This this should have been expected in 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 certain terms, but um, especially on the Columbus side, uh, you know, Tigres, I, they're kind of in a, a a weird spot right now. They're very good in terms of league MX and and Concacaf clubs in general, but they're not as good as they have been in years past, and that's just because their core is getting older. I mean, that's just the way of the world. You know, uh, Gignac is uh, thirty nine this year. Uh, their goalkeeper, Nahuel Guzman, is, is 40. Um, a couple of their other players, like Guido Pizarro, are in their 30s, uh, very important players. And they're going through that generational shift. They've signed a lot of very good young Mexican players, mostly like Diego Lainez and, and Marcelo Flores and Sebastián Córdoba, that have been really good for them. But they're, again, like they're not this sort of 2018, 2019, 2020 version of Tigres. Uh, and Monterrey, you know, if you would ask my colleague uh, Hercules Gomez, he would say that they have a, a, a reputation at, at this point that's well earned, mind you, uh, in terms of the psychology of going into some of these big matches. They, they do tend to freeze up. And that's the reason why they don't have more League MX titles, despite having, uh, you know, honestly, I'd say the best roster in League MX and the best roster maybe outside of Inter-Miami or, or, or on par with Inter-Miami. Um that's again, that's a mental thing. That's something that they need to work on because talent wise, they have it all. But Columbus was able to exploit that because if there's one thing that we know about MLS teams in general, American teams in general, they're going to have their heads on straight, right? Mentality is going to be there and you're going to be able to upset some teams by way of just believing in yourself, honestly. So, um, you know, Pachuga, on the other hand, I mentioned this before. They're a team that develops their own talent via their farm system, via, via their youth clubs. Um, those kids have been playing together for the last 10 years or so, right? So they they know they know everything about each other, and uh, they, they certainly play like it. Their head coach, uh, Memo Almada, is a guy that I thought should have taken over the Mexican national team because he is a fantastic talent evaluator and a fantastic talent developer. Um He's also a very, very smart tactician. He was able, I mean, again, Club America, 
they're the reigning champs and they knocked them off in the semifinals. They were looking, you know, two, three weeks ago. Club America was thinking about going back to back in League MX and they were thinking about winning this Champions Cup. That would have been three titles in six months. Now they've lost to Pachuca and they're going to face them again in the League MX quarterfinals. So there's a very good possibility that Pachuca denies them of both of those tournaments. So uh, really good veteran leadership with uh, Salomon Rondon, the, the Venezuelan long career in Europe. Usama Drizzi as well, the, the Moroccan winger who has been just amazing for them. Also a guy that spent plenty of years in European soccer. So this is going to be a, you know, for neutral fans of these, you know, specific teams, but maybe obviously you're supporting one of the two leagues. It's going to be a fantastic series. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of the level of play, the hunger for both of these teams to not just win this title, but also move on to the, uh, to the club world cup. Um, you said it yourself, you know, I think this is going to be a classic and I think it's going to be really, really fun. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an instant classic. Like you said, two well-coached teams, uh, not the big spenders of each, you know, in in their perspective in their uh, respected leagues. Uh, Columbus is like probably mid mid in the league as far as um, mid table of where they spend compared to other clubs. Um, they're just really they're coached very well by Wilfred Nancy, a guy who I would love to see be the national team coach for the U.S. It's funny yeah. you said that you you wish you saw the the Pachuca manager as the national team manager for Mexico. So what what is your do you have a prediction? Do you do you have a score prediction or which way it could go or? Yeah, I, you know what? Again, and I think this goes back to something that I mentioned earlier in, in League's Cup. I think League's Cup has made it ironically more dangerous for League MX teams to lose out on this particular tournament because you know you can make every argument under the sun um, as to why League MX teams didn't perform well in last year's League's Cup, and the first thing being the fact that the entire tournament is held in the United States, travel, all that. But the fact remains, you already lost that tournament to MLS, right? It would be disastrous for League MX at this point to lose a, a, again, you know, Seattle won in 2022, so it would be MLS's second title in three years, and then you would start to have some real fun with that banner because you're saying, okay, I mean, it's been two in the last three years. Um, MLS is clear of League MX, and you're going to have people on the Mexican side saying that as well. So um, I, don't, I don't think Pachuca carries that type of pressure with them. I think it, it would have been a lot more pressure on a team like Club America or, or Monterrey or Tigres to kind of hoist that League MX flag. I think Pachuca, they're, they're kind of unbothered, right? And I think that's that the same with Columbus, but watching both of those teams closely, and I have watched both of those teams closely, not just at the uh, Champions Cup level, but at the league level, I would say that right now, um, Pachuca is a little bit better than Columbus, but again, you know, if, if let's play devil's advocate here, if Columbus beat Mon Monterrey and Tigres, why wouldn't they be able to beat Pachuca? Right. So I still think Pachuca is going to win this, but I think again, instant classic, and we're going to go down to the wire extra time, maybe penalty kicks. It's going to be insane. Yeah, that's that's my that's my feeling on it. I don't think it's going to be one sided either way. I think it's going to go back and forth. I could see uh, both teams having great home performances and just a matter of who ends up scoring mo more goals on the road or if anybody scores at all. It's just that's what it's going to come down to. And, you know, Pachuca's playing with house money. Like you said, they're not yeah. even supposed to be here. What while, you know, the Columbus crew just won MLS Cup. So they they are expected to be one of the better represented teams in Major League Soccer for the CONCACAF Champions Cup. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, you know, I, I can't wait to see, you know, finally who wins and if MLS can consistently, uh, you know, uh, cross that barrier and, and win Champions Cup more consistently. But Eric, I appreciate your time and where can people follow you at? Yeah, uh, so on X, at Eric Gomez 86. You can also go on uh, TikTok. It's the same, at Eric Gomez 86. Also, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that little bell notification so you never miss a video. Guys, if you like the content, subscribe so you don't miss any more. I appreciate all the support you guys show me. It's been an honor. It's been fun, and it, it's just great making content that you all enjoy. So I really appreciate that. And until next time, I will see you all soon.